before we start uh, today's uh, session, uh, one thing, uh, because of some technical glitch we couldn't show yesterday, and that was uh, yesterday morning, I mean, yesterday our media conference was supposed to start with uh, Anupam Kherjit's keynote. Uh, as we all know, he couldn't stay here, but he uh, kindly and graciously shared one video that he requested to show. Unfortunately, we couldn't show yesterday. So whoever not there yesterday didn't miss anything, but we are going to start with that. And then I will request uh, Akhanji to take over. Thank you. Sudhara, 
for social reforms. This list really touches a quarter of the publications that were published all across the Bharat at that time. It's equally hard to forget the contribution of entertainment media in, in the form of stage acts and later in movies and music to bring society together against the external enemies of the nation. The role of entertainment media was sometimes more important as it reached out in regional languages to masses who couldn't read or write. How can we forget the use of Free India Radio by Nikali Subhash Chandra Bose from Berlin to spread the message of Azad in Sena? During the same era, Tilak, Savarkar, Gandhi, Lala Lajpat Rai, Lala Ardeyal, Rabindranath Tagore, Pandit Nehru, Surendranath Danaji, Dr. Rajendra Prasad wrote several books and shared their analysis and vision about Bharat and Hindus to inspire masses. Excluding the dark days of emergency between 1975 to 1977, media in post-independence, India has always enjoyed the freedom to express its opinion, ideologies, and even perceptions. However, by the 1990s, many Hindus began to feel sidelined by the media. By and large, they didn't feel that their faith, their culture, or their causes were being fairly portrayed. Then came the World Wide Web and Internet. Communication, the great leveler, leveler the advent of social media has ushered the democratization of media like never before. Now there is hope for truth in reporting, in reporting of the people, for the people, and by the people. Ultimately, in an independent nation with digital technology, the new media will not only survive but flourish, provided that the diversity of the population and of thought is respected. Now more than ever, it is incumbent upon the media in all forms to rational and to share opinions based on accurate facts and ethical research. I hope that in the next two days of this conference, we keep this duty in mind and actively discuss ideas and opinions to find new, diverse ways to bring society together. Namaste. That was a wonderful message by Anupam Kheerji. But before we start, uh, I would like to start with a quick prayer. And the prayer is, Om A No Bhadra Kratto Yandu Vishwata. Let auspicious ideas come to us from all directions. Thank you. Um, everybody has cell phones or smartphones, right? You do? I'm not asking you to turn it off. Please use it. <laughs> Please use it to live stream. Tweet, live tweet, Facebook, everything. Just use uh, hashtag WHC social media. Okay. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, talking about social media and I'm um, sitting among the giants of social media as far as Hindu perspective is concerned. Uh, starting with Sunanda Ji, Sunanda Vashish. She is the co founder of Mind.net and she. Uh, frequently writes on that portal, but before she joined that, she has been a writer for a long time. Uh, she also runs a very uh, popular podcast, Mindmakers Podcast. She's from Houston. We have Chef Ali Ji, the warrior. <laughs> um, she, she's also a writer, independent writer. She has been writing on several portals uh, in different languages as well. Uh, many people know she is a sari expert too, along with Mum Temples, and she writes the, her travelogues too, right? So, welcome Shafali Ji. We have Vinay Singhal Ji, uh, he is the founder of Witty Feed, uh, a social media company, and uh, he has through his company generated so many followers. Three million, right? One million. Wow. 100 million globally, every month. And I'm sure we'll get to hear from him, or him uh, more details about it. And then finally, uh, but not the least, uh, Neha Ji. Um, Neha Ji uh, is a software engineer and also very active on Twitter as well as on Facebook. She 
also frequently writes on various issues. She is an uh, activist and uh, founder of Shaktitva Project. And I'm uh, really, I feel great to be sitting here among the great Shaktitva <laughs> warriors here. Then you'll get to hear more about what Shaktitva is uh, from Nehaji, but this is what Shakti is for us, right? So anyway, so, um, you know, I'll get right to it. Um, I, I, I had a great opportunity, we hear a lot about JNU, and I had a great opportunity to be at JNU and learn from some of the great rishis who are the modern day professors. One of them is already here. I didn't learn from him, but I know him. Professor Makaran Paranjpe is here. And he has recently been appointed the director of Indian Institute of Advanced Studies in Shimla. So congratulations, Makaranji. And I also got to learn from Professor Kapil Kapoor. He's a great Indologist. Those who know him, you know. And it was really a good thing to be in his class. I mean, people say it's hard to survive in JNU if you're not a leftist. Talk about Professor Kapil Kapoor. There are a lot of people all the time taking his classes, and he was very popular. And it's always fun to be in his class. So he used to tell us, see, uh, that uh, we always say, you know, um, if you protect dharma, dharma protects you. But how do we protect dharma? And he said, you know, we have to protect the dharma with shastra or shastra. Dono ka upyog karna hai, shastra ka bhi aur shastra ka bhi jab jab dharma pe sankat aata hai. To I'm trying to say is that the, the, some of the social media tools that we have that we use today is for me, the way I see it, is both Shastra and Shastra. Shastra, mein, Shastra mein we, we try to educate, disseminate information from our perspective. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of examples that can be given about it. But Shastra is also when we counter uh, people like a uh, very famous quote unquote professor from Rutgers University. Uh, which, when that professor makes comments about Sri Ram and Sri Sita and Mata Sita, and we counter her, we also uh, counter some fake narratives about Eid Kachan, Sri Krishna Eid Kachan, right? So we, so we are using those tools to counter them. Uh, So in that context, we have to see uh, uh, our movement forward. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep it to myself <laughs> for now. Uh, I'll turn to uh, our speakers here. Sunandaji, um, you have been writing for a long time. And one of the things that comes up to my mind when I think about you, is the powerful speech you gave after Amarnath uh, murdered Amarnath yeah, three years ago. And the way it became, your video that you, your speech, it became viral overnight. And when I watched it, when I got home and I watched it, got to work and I watched it in the morning, I cried. Literally cried. And there are many people who will, you know, vouch for that. So can you tell us the story, how you got into it, and also tie it up with your story about the uh, Amarnath? Namaste. Thank you so much, Aftan Sri. It's a privilege to be here. I have never attended Kumbh Mela. I have never been to Kumbh. So this is the largest congregation of Hindus that I have ever attended. This is the largest amount of Hindus I have ever been with. Now, 
from your perspective, that's a wonderful thing. But from, come, from where I come from, but the point of view that I carry, it is overwhelming because I grew up in a state in Bharat where Hindus, only state in Bharat, where Hindus are in a minority. So for me, since yesterday, I have been walking around with a big bindi, with a sari, and with bangles and mangal sutra walking around. None of you will imagine how happy that makes me because I spent my entire childhood not knowingly, not not on purpose, but very aware of my Hindu identity and I'm ashamed to say even hiding it because that was the only way to survive. That was the only way to avoid trouble. That was the only way as a girl to stay out of any kind of, you know, um, troublemakers, stay out of the way of any kind of troublemakers. So to the World Hindu Congress, my eternal gratitude for inviting me here and giving me this wonderful opportunity to be with you all. Thank you. Afghan's chief um, actually set the ball rolling with uh, that little um, uh, story that he said about um, Amarnath Yatra. Um, you know, the speech I made. Let me give you a little story about that and then I will tie it with social media and how I have been involved in it and my other points that, uh, substantial points that I want to bring forward to you about um, social media and how I feel it can be used. So, um, I was traveling and this invitation to speak and I was traveling when uh, this news came, which was nothing new to me, but uh, it was the news nevertheless that um, pilgrims, Amarnath pilgrims, Shiva devotees had been attacked uh, in a bus, a bus, they were going in a bus and they were attacked, some of them had lost their lives, few had been injured. And there was a Amarnath, uh, for the victims uh, in Houston, I live in Houston, and the organizations, the Hindu organizations got there together to do, um, uh, you know, a Prathana Sabha. And I was invited to speak there. My colleague Adit is here, he was with me and he will bear witness to it. When I walked into the um, room, I thought I will just, you know, uh, what does one say after 25 years of persecution? I thought I would just go and I would say all the Apple and my, my statements, I'm sorry this happened. And I would just go because after 25 years one tends to get tired. And then the priest there, he um, said some mantras for the peace of the people who had lost their lives. And that is when something happened. I have written about Kashmir for the last 20 years, but I have kept personal and my other um, commentary aside. I have never mixed the two. But something happened that day, and in Hindi, I I went there and I narrated my entire story. And I won't waste time speaking it here, but you can go to YouTube and you can listen to it after the program today. And I said, I wrote a story about a 10-year-old, how we were persecuted and how my grandfather actually took an axe and said, I will kill you before the intruders come. And that's when I had said, I had lost my childhood forever. So I narrated those stories. These were stories that my husband also did not know. My children did not know because I had not told them. You know, it's such a, uh, you know, it had been in the deepest recesses of my heart. And that day it just came out. And here is where social media comes in. There were about 40 to 50 people in that room, as is the bane of, <laughs> forgive me for saying this, of Hindus everywhere. Whenever there is anything, all we can manage is in that 150,000 people in Houston, all we managed that Thursday evening was 40 to 50 people. And I said, okay, let me, I wasn't talking to the audience, I wasn't, it didn't matter, I just, it was a cathartic experience. I spoke, and the credit for that was to Adit, he's here, 
he recorded it and um, he put it on our mind where you know our website and on YouTube I came home I slept in the morning when I woke up my phone was broken with the messages that I had and the amount it had just gone viral from I had messages from Africa, I had messages from Europe, I had messages from the United States, from India, everywhere. So I thought I was speaking only to 40 people. By morning, there were about 4 million people who had heard that uh, video. So, just, this, and there were the messages that came to me were, we never knew this happened. These are Hindus who were born and raised in India who said, really, did this happen in Kashmir? Did this really happen? Did you really have to go out? Were you really thrown out of your homes? Did this? I mean, I was shocked at the amount of ignorance there is. And I'm not blaming anybody. Maybe a lot of fault is with us also. We have not been able to uh, communicate as much as we should have. And this is where social media ties in. And I will give you a few examples of why, how I use social media and how I have been empowered by it. First of all, when we say social media, what are we talking about? Social media versus mainstream media. These two nomenclatures, after this, I want you to throw it out of your lives. Mainstream media is not mainstream media because it does not carry any mainstream opinion. So, please do not call it mainstream media when you leave from here. I call it big media, corrupt media, Lutian's media, Delhi-based media, but it's not mainstream media. This is mainstream media right here. And you are mainstream media right there. So, so, then, so that is one thing I want you to really follow in your life. So this is a, you know, um, um, old boys club. So one person talks about nuclear disarmament, same person goes on another channel and talks about environmental disasters and third time he goes and third hour he goes and he talks about um, some women empowerment. So they know such about all three. So uh, let's get that out. Social media is a democratic media. So dictatorial media versus democratic media. That is the nomenclature that we should use. Nomenclatures are very important. If there's one thing that you should remember when you get out of the room, it's nomenclatures. Let's use the right nomenclature for the right thing. Let's not use the words that we have been told. So that's that's one thing I, want, I wanted to preface it with. Then I want to give you another example how at uh, because I have been involved with this since 2008, 2009. Uh, I will give you an exact moment when social media came of age in heart. And as a good media personality, I love a scandal. So social media also started with a, with a ban, with a scandal. And I'll give you this example. I don't know how many of you remember that or how many of you have been, uh, were part of social media at that time. Uh, forgive me for taking names, but uh, no, looking at the faces here, if anyone thought we would take names or if we would be reverent towards anybody, you are mistaken, you are in the wrong room. So, um, so at that time, Congress spokesperson Abhishek Manu Singhvi, most of you must have seen him on the TV, he got into a scandal. My microphone is not okay. He, um, he got into a scandal.
and they land somewhere in um, museums in New York and London and everywhere then they get sold or whatever. So no one had this awareness. As Hindus even I have to admit, I did not understand how big of a problem this was. So this group, India Pride Project, they actually did an entire um, research where they found that this money is also funding terror. That is when we sort of arose, but that is how they use social media very effectively to create awareness about it. So if you follow Bring Our Gods back home, you will see that a lot of movies have come back and everything. So that's a very successful example and that makes me very happy. Second example is our own Kashmiri Hindus, um, the example of Kashmiri Hindus. Uh, the way before social media was um, invented or before social media came or even before internet came, um, we were, the story of Kashmiri Hindus was told like, um, you know, uh, 20 people were taken to hospital because of food contamination. And then 700,000 Hindus were drawn, driven out of their homes. That was the same tone and tenor used. Nothing was different. It was just like 20 people had been hospitalized for food contamination. So when internet came, for, even before social media, when internet came, there were a bunch of people, I'll just take one more minute, there were a bunch of people who, you know, chronicled this entire story about who we were, how, where we came from, what had happened to us, and it's only through the pages of uh, internet and through social media our story is alive today, and I'm telling you. I have one such activist, Lalit Paul, sitting right here, who painstakingly wrote the names of every single martyr of Hindu uh, Hindus who had fallen to bullets. Every single martyr. Not one Chor Media or Rajiv's Media did that. He did that even before social media. You can check it. And when social media came, so we got our film and we started talking about it, but we are still nowhere near any kind of, I mean, it's a whole story, we'll need another panel discussion for that. But I'm saying we've had middling success in just making our stories known. And I'm just, last point, where we have completely failed, and I'll give you an example of we have not been able to set the narrative, is cow slaughter issue. Cow slaughter issue is about legality and illegality. That is the framework that this debate should be framed in. The way it is being, because cow slaughter is banned in 24 states, has been banned by Congress government since 1947, even before that. So if anything that happens which is not legal, the debate is completely about legal and illegality. It is not a tolerance versus intolerance debate. At that point, you know, we have to ask, people who are talking about have to ask that is, is the society ready for cow slaughter? India is a representative democracy. If people are really, uh, you know, if they agree that cow slaughter should happen, then people who are screaming intolerance should go to their representatives and lawmakers, and lawmakers should take a stand before all of you and before all the constituents and say, listen, we are going to bring a law which will allow cow slaughter. Why do lawmakers not take that stand? You know why? Because there is no public opinion for it. So, the only thing that happens is in TV studios, they sit here and they talk about tolerance, non-tolerance, which is garbage. The real issue is legality and illegality. But here we have not been able to form the narrative. So this is something I take blame for as well, that anytime you see anything about Gohatya, it should, the debate should only be framed till the law is there. Till the law is there, till the lawmakers in parliament go and change it. Till the law is here, it should completely be about legality and illegality about this. And I will take more questions. I mean, I have to say more, but when the question and answers happen, I will um, say more. But thank you for your patient yes. hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will have a question and session. But uh, moving on, Sushilji, uh, taking a cue from Sunanda Ji. Next, all Hindu conference may social media may not be here. I may not be able to do uh, anyway, and uh, you know, another thing that Sunandaji talked about is the uh, um, Anurag Kashyap's, uh, Anurag Saxena's pride, yes, uh, pride 
India Prize Project. You can Google him, you can listen to his speech. It's a wonderful speech. And uh, another aspect of that is still, in the US, we have several murtis that are sitting in consulate, waiting to be transported back to India. So uh, they just, they, they have given it to us, but they haven't made it back. So please uh, keep that in mind. Uh, moving on now uh, to Chef Ali Ji. I'm just going from back to right. So Chef Ali Ji, um, you know, we have been, uh, you have been writing for a long time and uh, um, you have been educating people also about uh, sari, as I said, and mandirs. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that I remember about your uh, speech when you made about the uh, Goa Inquisition, um, I don't know how many people know about it, but that is one story that Shefali Ji, through her social media, had brought in the fore. And now uh, we all know, right? So I will ask you to talk about a little bit about that journey, but also please talk about some science in Temple too. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a great opportunity. I was listening to Sunanda and I was thinking to myself when she talked about her speech after the Amarnath incident and the reactions to it and so many people coming up to her and saying that we didn't know that this happened, I'm so sorry, I should have known it. And I realized that it's the exact same thing that happened to me after I spoke about Goa Inquisition and what my ancestors suffered. And in a way, her story is my story too, only it happened in the 16th century. But the exact same thing that happened to her 30 years ago or 20 years ago was what happened to my family in 16th century. They were also told exactly as Sunanda's family and the Kashmiri Hindus were told to leave, convert or get killed. That was the choice my ancestors were given to in the 16th century in Goa. Every Hindu of Goa was given that choice. Some of them converted. Hello. Some of them converted for various reasons, but many of them, a majority of them, they actually chose to leave their land, leave their property, leave everything and just move to another place with just a clothes on their back. And in my house, there is a little bit of mitti of my original village in the mandir at home, which has been lying there for so many years, because that was the only connection that whoever made that move to my current village had with this ancestral village that and of course the affiliation to the family deity. Be as that may be, the reactions to my talk after it went viral and that is the power of social media, I got, if I had one dollar each time somebody from this gathering told me that I saw your Goa Inquisition talk, I didn't know anything about it. If I have one dollar each time, I would be able to afford a business class flight back home. <laughs> But the reactions that I got from Goa were the ones that made it very interesting. That talk went viral in Goa and there were very virulent reactions from both sides, from the Hindu side as well as the Christian side. So many of the Christians who took umbraj to my talk, their question was, why are you spreading hate? I was like, excuse me, I'm talking about what happened. All, every single thing that I've spoken about is a fact and I can give you references and I have given my references. And what do you mean by spreading hate? Do you mean to say that when they destroyed my temples, the Portuguese, the Jesuits destroyed 300 temples in a year in one district in Goa in uh, 1580 something. So when they did it, that was not spreading hate. When they actually told people to get converted or get killed, that was not spreading hate. But I am talking about it, giving references, that is spreading hate. How, how, how is this narrative even done? This is where social media comes into the picture. Because when I gave this talk at Srijan Foundation, again the room was full of 40 people. But once the talk was out there in social media, close to some 10 lakh people in India have seen the talk. And I have received so many letters and some genuine queries from Goan Christians wanting to know about their history. And that has counted as my success. 
I tell you a little about my journey about social media. Actually, I had taken a long break from writing. I used to write on lifestyle uh, issues. I used to write on textiles, travel, before that. I was always opinionated, as you can imagine. But uh, before uh, my kids were, my kid, I have triplets, my kids were very young then, so I had taken a break. And that time I used to only write about, uh, you know, my political opinions only on my social media page, but mostly I used it like a new parent does to tell the world about how great my children were. I'm sure all of us have done that. But suddenly, in I think it was in 2011 or 2012, I'm not sure, when Rahul Gandhi was first made the Vice President of the Congress, that's when I got really bucked and I had to vent it out. So I wrote a post on my Facebook which was open only to my family and friends. But somebody shared it and then overnight it became viral and that's when I suddenly realized that here is a platform where I can speak about things that really matter to me and it reaches a wide audience without any gatekeeping, without any editorial control and I don't have to depend upon an editor, I don't have to depend upon any platform. Whatever I say directly reaches people and which is what the, the so-called mainstream media was supposed to do. Their job was to give voice to the dispossessed. Their job was to talk about the inequalities, about the injustices, give opinion to people who didn't have an opinion. But the big media didn't do it. So it was left to social media and individuals like me or Sunandaji or Neha to talk about whatever really uh, mattered to them. And that is how the whole journey began. And if you want to know the success of social media, you should see how the big media has uh, transitions from describing me. When I started off writing, I was just a housewife turned troll. Then gradually I became a right-wing troll. Then I became a right-wing columnist. Now I'm an independent writer and blogger. This is not me speaking. This is the big media adjectives that they use for me when they introduce me. And that is the power of social media because in four years, I see that I've moved from this position to, I am where I am. But mainstream media, the alleged mainstream media thinks that I have moved from housewife turned troll to independent writer and blogger. And it is not just me as an individual. You look through uh, New York Times uh, uh, New York Times articles, just search Hinduism and search uh, New York Times. You will see the entire history of articles that they have written. They have moved from calling Hindus to Hindu extremists, to Hindu fundamentalists, to Hindu nationalists now. They, the rest of the content has remained the same. The pejorative uh, insinuations, the abuse, the kind of topics that they choose to write about have remained the same. But the adjectives have changed from Hindu extremist to Hindu, to Hindu fundamentalist to Hindu nationalist. And why has that change come across? That is led by social media. Social media catches lies. Social media gives you facts. Social media is so quick that if big media makes an error within two minutes, literally within two minutes, somebody will find the true facts and somebody will put it out on Twitter. Uh, so Nandaji spoke about that uh, unfortunate tape of Abhishek Manu Singhvi. I wish she had it because when I saw that tape for two days, I was off my food, quite honestly. So I wish she didn't really you know, talk about it and bring back those sad memories, but never mind. And chronic history of social media. But that is the thing, and if you look at it, mainstream media has killed so many stories. The alleged Latians media has killed so many stories just because the narrative was not convenient for them. Yesterday, Dalit Singh Ji, who is the spiritual leader of Nandari Sikhs, uh, Sikh, uh, spoke here in the plenary session. Did you know, we all know about Jaliwala Bagh massacre. Do you know about the Malay Kotla massacre? Do you know that 70 Namdhari Sikhs were blown away by making them put their heads into a cannon by the British? And do you know why that happened? Because they opposed cow slaughter. Sikhs opposed cow slaughter in Malay Kotla and they went and fought against the Muslim butchers who basically killed cows just to offend the Hindus and the Sikhs. But nobody is going to tell you that story. It's only social media can. It's only handles like true analogy who can tell you about these uh, facets of history. But what social media will tell you is they will tell you about one small incident about Gorakshak's lynching somebody day in and day out. That's all they tell you. They wait for some person to make an inflammatory statement. 
treatment and of course there are flame elements on every side but they do not give voice to rational Hindu voices they always amplify voices some person will say something inflammatory in some village and basically these are all propped up handles and suddenly that uh, quote becomes big news in big media there are talking heads in TV studios talking about it and suddenly it becomes an issue but what about real issues happening in India all the time New York Times or other big media, international media, will tell you about Gorakshak snitching, ad nausea, will go on and on and on about it. But Madhu Pandit Das runs the biggest midday meal program in the world. 1.7 million children are getting fed uh, through Akshay Patra Foundation. Where is that story? It's a beautiful human interest story. It's a, it's a humanitarian story. It's not a Hindu story. It's a global humanitarian story. But where is the narrative? Where do you see it in mainstream media? But one killing somewhere in some small uh, village somewhere in India, and then suddenly it becomes big news internationally. And I'm going to talk here about, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Elphinstone Road tragedy where the railway bridge collapsed. And there were people, there were ordinary people there trying to save the women who were stuck on the bridge. And there was one guy who was trying to grab a woman and pull her out. And his video got circulated and uh, the Hindu, I think it was, they did a story, a full story, and they called that man a molester and they said, dying woman gets molested in India. And that story was caught by the international media within like half an hour. In two days it was there in the independent, it was in almost all the big international newspapers. And there was no truth to it. That is the sad part of it. But that man, imagine if you were that man, Imagine if all you were doing were trying to save a dying woman and at that point of time you're not looking where you're touching, you're, basic, you're, you're in panic and your only priority is to save that person. So the video was an 8 second video. On an 8 second video somebody played the judge, jury and the executioner and termed this man a molester of a dying woman. Can you imagine anything worse than this? And this story was flashed all over the place. But social media, within one or two hours, they actually came up with longer videos, videos taken from other angles, where it was clearly obvious that the man was trying to save the woman and not trying to molest her. And afterwards, of course, the Hindu issued an apology after three days on page three. But by the time the damage was done, internationally, the story had reached. And what opinion do people have? Already they are eager to call in their life. Thank you. 
Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay, now where was I? Just give me two minutes. So, so talking about trolls, there is always this whiny narrative from, of women on the other side, mostly it's women, about how alleged right-wing trolls threaten them or, or uh, you know, make life miserable for them. I can assure you that every one of us on this side of the table have been trolled equally badly. I have had to complain to the cops twice, once when my family was threatened. I cannot tell you how bad it was to read a threat to my daughter from uh, somebody who is obviously a fake name. And I had to go to the cops and they found out who did it, but that's besides the point. But I am not the one who is going to cry victim. I am not, one, not uh, one to say that, oh, we are getting trolled as well. But what really upset me once was when the nepotism and dynasty TV was going on this... <laughs> Trolls, how they how they bully uh, women on the other side, and they had done a lot of narratives, some true, some fictitious, some imaginary. So I wrote to them that this is what happened to me. Do you have the guts to carry my story? So Sonia Singh, who heads nepotism and dynasty TV, she actually, as a favor to me, in a very condescending tone, she did a story. But do you know what she did? She did not even have the courtesy to get my last name right. See, she Shefali Yadav, right-wing troll, got troll too, was the story. And I was like, do you think I am so, uh, what you call it, I am so unimportant that you don't even take care, you don't even do editorial diligence to get my name correct? And when I wrote to her, and I said, you know what, I don't really need it, my reach is fine, and, I'm, and I say it with, uh, with, take me on my word for it, my reach today is multiple times that of nepotism and dynasty uh -huh. I don't need them, they need me. They actually called me to come on their show. I told them I'm not interested in talking to nepotism and dynasty TV. That's besides the point again. So she wrote to me saying that, oh, but we did a story for you. You should be happy. Like she's doing me a favor. This is the attitude that the big media brings to the table always. And this is, and on one side they are saying that you guys don't get trolled at all, we are the only ones who get trolled. And on the other side they are saying that your freedom of expression should be curtailed. Makrat Deshpande should know how much the big media, the editors of the big media harangued him when he was trying to curate the Pondicherry Literature Festival. Who does that? Sorry, Makrat Panaspe. <laughs> who does that? The people who talk about freedom of expression in the morning, evening and night, they are the same people who basically demonize a literature festival and say they essentially said that it should be, uh, it should be held at all. I saw a tweet by an editor, I forgot who it was. He said, that, have you noticed that people on the right side, there is a disproportionate num number of scientists, doctors, engineers, CAs. I mean, seriously, what's your problem? Does it really hurt that highly educated successful people are voicing their opinions now? Are opinions an exclusive uh, monopoly of uh, journalists? So a journalist can write about anything from sports to science to economy, the same journalist. Mr. Shekhar Gupta has an opinion on everything from the cast of Italy to the number of sports medals that uh, India has to win. But we cannot have expertise in our own field and have opinions. This kind of monopoly is what the social media has destroyed and the big media knows it. But now what is happening is, in 2014, the narrative was overwhelmingly on the side of social media, on social media. But now the other side has realized the importance of social media and they are also investing big time on making their presence felt on social media. That is a problem I think we all need to talk about and we all need to find some ways to counter. Thank you. You know, uh, she talks about the mainstream media, and especially when we talk about mainstream media, we think of English language media. 
Um, I looked at the BART data. BART is an organization that keeps the uh, viewership of all the news channels. If you look at the data, the top five news channels in English. <laughs> So if you combine all top five news channels in English, and I'm from Bihar originally, and then combine the top Bhojpuri channel, they don't even come together, okay? Just one Bhojpuri channel, they don't even come together. So that's, you know, but they have power. But moving on, uh, that's a good segue here. Uh, sitting to my right is Vinay Singhalji. He comes from a different perspective to social media. We have been, you know, if you're talking in terms of economics, we are consumers. He's the producer. Through his company, he has reached out to so many people. Uh, I will actually let him talk about his journey. Thank you. Namaste. You know, uh, the best thing that I love about this conference, and I'm very new to uh, this type of conferences, is that uh, everyone here when they greet each other and I've been, I've been talking to a lot of people who were coordinating for this talk uh, for last 2-3 months and then last 2 days here and meeting probably at least 100 people in the last 2 days everybody greets you with a namaste and they hear your name with a G right? I, I, need to, I need to appreciate the words in the comments for doing that as a norm across. So, round of applause for all of them, yes. That's, that's culture in the most native format. Why I was able to notice it? Because I run a company uh, which is a content media company and, and uh, the way we make money is we work with brands to integrate them into content and do the native content marketing. The, the idea is... Hello. If you're not able to guess my age, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, everybody greets me with a G. That gives me, that gives me such a different essence of what Hindu culture and what overall Indian culture is all about. So, thank you so much for integrating the the Hindu culture in such a native way. Uh, as as Avantisji also uh, introduced me, I, I come from a very different uh, background from uh, the three uh, ladies we have on the dais. Uh, I run a media company. I started it uh, eight years ago. When I was still in my college, I was doing engineering there. And I just wanted to do something good with my life, good with my uh, college days. I started, uh, uh, I, I just started an IT company. Uh, that's what we Indians are best at. At least people here in the US would know that, right? So, so I started this usual website software making company. In 2012, that was 2010. 2012, uh, we started a Facebook page. It was called Amazing Things in the World, and it's very important that you know it because uh, the, the the message behind the page was very simple. The world has so much good to tell, but it is so focused on telling the bad part of it. Today, I realize that is what exactly uh, Sunandaji and uh, Sifali was uh, telling us that 
it's actually the media that there is so much good to tell but they're so focused on telling the bad part of it that we don't get to hear the good ones which is what led to restarting this facebook page called amazing things in the world and the idea was very simple take all the positive stories let's share them with the world let's see if we can inspire people uh, uh, global came very naturally to us i am not a media student i i i i have i don't know content by education by theory so it came very naturally to me i did not know at that point in time that we were starting a media company fast forward to 2014 which is when uh, the pain brand that we have which is really feel uh, we started that and i went to uh, a lot of people i met a lot of people by the time we started to know a lot of people industry investors and all all kinds of people and i tell i i went to them i said you know i i have built a community of global citizens who are uh, from us from uk canada australia from india everywhere and they are there to celebrate some positive content i want to build a company i want to build a global media company from india and you know what every single one of them i don't remember a single person telling me and that should tell us something again about the media and the narrative in the media and, and the kind of confidence we carry in india about ourselves every single industry person every single investor every single of my friend mentors advisor told me that first of all india cannot produce global companies and second they told me even if it was possible you are doing media india just do not know how to do global media i am so proud to tell you today that out of 100 million users over a month that we have on our platform 60 million of them are not from india and these are not indians that i am talking about every third american was on our content american on our content in 2016 and 2017 both so the kind of power that we hold with that the kind of influence that we can bring with that it's just not so so you know this whole industry this whole they they give a different different normal culture to uh, you know uh, the the mainstream media or the lutian so the uh, you know dictatorial media or whatever it is uh, i'll tell you what we 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 have a separation history of 800 years right and whatever we are today we have been we are we are almost a product of that and it's such a unfortunate situation to be in that we have lost a lot of that confidence a lot of we 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 have undermined ourselves so much that we have forgotten that we are way much older than those 800 years that we have been suppressed for which is why the the fact that we have survived after 800 years 800 years of suppression is the fact that tells you that how old and how strong we are that brings me to my uh, uh probably starting point of you know uh, what i wanted to my topic that i was given was changing the narrative of hinduism in the hindu dharma in the today's media the the, the term hinduism the the first ever uh time the word hindu uh was used was in 1823 by uh, a british lord called lord macleay he brought in some philosophers and uh, he brought in some intellectuals so called intellectuals from uh, 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 from uk and brought them to india and he built a committee where the the idea that he gave the statement that he made to them that we 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 do not want to win or india or rule them just just by government or rule them we also need to enslave them intellectually and so we need to create a class of intellectuals we need to create a class of intellectuals slash interpreters who will basically be enslaved and will be british in their every thought but indian in their looks and and which will be able to basically then help us enslave a larger society in the in the country the word became the the hindu word in hinduism became even more popular in the 19th century and that's the that's the whole history of it the real the real word for our dharma our religion is the word sanatan dharma right that's how we all know it and do you know the actual meaning of the word sanatan the word is eternal law the eternal law the the laws of living life even before the human history that's what it exactly <coughs> means i tell you what this is not even a religion this is basically nothing but a simple collection of some rules some rituals 
and some traditions put together to have a happy and prosperous life. Can you ever explain any religion more simpler than this? That's the beauty of Sanatan Dharma and Hindu Dharma for you, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, let, let me, because I come from a, uh, I come from the younger generation and I come from uh, a, a company which I built on the basis of technology, I built the content company. And a lot of people when I was talking to were asking me a simple question that, you know, how do I explain uh, 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 the religion, how do I explain uh, Hinduism and how, why it is so important, this dharma is so important to my kids. I, I follow it, but you know, how do I take my kids to temples? Let me explain in their language. In technology, and because all of your IT people, you, a lot, lot of your IT people, you'll understand that much better. There is something called platform and there is something called product, right? When you build a platform, a lot of products are built on the top of the on the top of the platform. For an example, internet. Internet is a platform. Internet is a platform that uh, that made the whole media democratic, the whole world more democratic. It brought in everybody's view out there. It was it was a platform, and the products of internet were you know platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Google, and you know all the all the companies that we know all all the things that you know people who are still sitting in front of you on the dais are products of internet which we, we built on the, on, the, on the top of the platform. Hindu dharma is exactly like that. Hindu dharma is the platform. It is not the product, it is the platform. There are a lot of products that you can build on the top of that. Another language that I will, another analogy that I will make is Hindu dharma is the, is the open source religion of the world. It is, it is the open source religion of the world. Why? Because in, when, when you have something open source, anybody can take it, anybody can build their own narrative of it, anybody can make some changes into it and it will still accept, and anybody can rebrand it in their own name and sell it and it's still okay. I'll tell you what, there are so many of them that we have, that have been built on the open source platform of Hindu Dharma. For example, just give me one more minute and I'll finish. For example, Sikhism, Jainism, Buddhism, these are direct products of which are built out of the open source platform of Hinduism and so proudly so, right? Islamism, Christianity, they have taken so much from the open source platform of Hinduism and built on the top of that. So, we are the open source platform. I don't think we have to be fearful or worried about any of that. We just have to, we just, we just have to make sure that we know that and we are able to tell that to the next generation as well. I have a lot of other points that I've built. But just one story that I want to share with you, which is that today the narrative is controlled by the, the mainstream, so-called mainstream media is because the ownership in media, 85% of which across the world is, is Christians, Jews and Parsis and in India the leftist. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but for sure there is no way those who do not understand Hinduism as an ideology, as a basic instinct will ever be able to portray it in the right way. Just one story and I'll end that, I'll end my talk with it, is that we today own six different brands. As I said, uh, Bidifleet is an Indian brand, uh, The Popple is an American brand, and we, we have six, six of them. Uh, very recently, uh, the, 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 the sad incident of uh, demise of Atul Bihariji happened, and uh, uh, by default we were, we were covering it. So Bidifleet, the, the brand that talks to Indian audience was covering it, there, there are two other, so there's a Hindi life from Dunya as it was covering it and you know, three of the brands are covering it. The Popal team, we have, we have a separate team of course to right side. The Popal team was, I, I went to them and said, you know, uh, what are you, are you guys doing, what are you doing on, on Bihariji, uh, his demise, Adalji's demise. And they were like, no, 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 this is not our story, we, we uh, why would we do it, it's, it's an Indian thing, what if he's doing it? I said, okay. So, I asked them a question, I said, tell me something. If the unfortunate incident of, let's say, Mr. Obama's demise was to happen today, do you think British people will cover it? They said, yes, he should. The New York will cover it, the Indian platform, yeah, yeah, they, will, they would. I said, why don't you think the Apology's demise is a story for you? Because, I'll tell you why, because you are, you are, you are grown up in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in, in an environment where, where what they are is so global and what we are is not. And it's so important that the ownership of 
Hindus and people who understand Hindu ideology basically own media so that we can actually translate that into our teams and tell them that Atul Bihari's demise is an international event because he is a politician of that structure and so the story on the purple has to happen because the American friends need to know about it and they will know it only when we do the story and that is the way we can control the narrative. So I'm sure Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, the talk about uh, you know all the negativity on the mainstream media and all reminds me again my uh, my guru Professor Kapil Kapoorji. He used to say, "Ye sab rudali hai, <laughs> rudali hai. Inka aur kuch kam nahi hai." So again, so let's uh, move on from the uh, from the rudalis to corrupt media. But these people have a voice. They have research. They have. This does not mean that we do. We carry un, um, you know, unsubstantiated stuff. We don't. We have full editorial diligence. But so you have to understand that while we are getting on to the other side, we have to do our editorial diligence. We have to have substantiated stuff, and we have to create institutions. That is where the new um, uh, media persons, that's where the new journalists will come, that is where we will hone them, and that is where the new gen next generation will come from. The institutions that we create today. I saw on the mind that there is an option, opportunity for all of us to contribute and that would be a good Absolutely, absolutely. There is an opportunity on mind.net to be shared, and there are things. Just give me one second. There is an author called Rajat Mitra who on mind.net would never written before, did a research, there's a one person who's learning, who actually had did a research and which n nobody knew, and um, the readers, that there is no Hindu temple in Delhi, which is Indra Pras, which is 100 years old. Can you believe that? This is something, I do not want any claps on this. I want you to think about this. There is no Hindu temple in Delhi that is 100 years old. And more than 100 years old. Which is not 100 years old, sir. It is. It was. It is not. It's a new thing. It, there, there are no ancient temples, or if they are, they were in hiding. There is no ancient Bhakti temple in Indra Pras. So these are the stories that we are carrying. No, as Shefali calls them, nepotism and dynasty theory is not going to carry the story. Thank you. Yeah, my question is very straightforward and simple. So we have a great strength on the ground, like Karat strength uh, from RSS, HSS, and everything. But uh, relatively, we are weaker uh, on the social media. So what are the tips or something that we can go back and make sure that we do and increase our strength, which matches our real strength? Thank you for asking that, sir. This is a very important point that I've been trying to make to every anybody who would listen to me. Because you, you have you have to understand that even though we are on social media and even though we are single handed like, activists who are coming from different walks of life, you this is a this is hard work, and the reason it is hard work is because you have to understand your audience and you have to cater to your audience, and that is what social media, uh, the mainstream media does for a full time job, and we are doing it as on the side. So the reason is because you have to understand that the same thing that works for a boy in UP does not work for a man in Mumbai. They are, they are different and there are social economic strata that you have to be pay attention to. There are backgrounds you have to pay attention to. Something that might resonate in South India because it's part of their daily culture and daily routine does not resonate uh, equally in, in North India. We had unfortunate amount of and very little coverage for Chennai floods back in the day, I actually uh, captured pictures of both vernacular and uh, media, uh, sorry, vernacular regional media as well as English media newspapers. When the Chennai was literally drowning, there was no attention being paid in the north. That sort of improved in Kerala floods. But then we got together and we are from all different parts of the country and we started making noise about it, contributing to it. I was even part of a WhatsApp group of volunteers that was coordinating volunteers on the ground. So that was the kind of reach we get and we have to uh, use it. So the things to learn about
about is figuring out what narrative works, what connects with the people, and using the right jargon. So that jargon, which is being taught through humanities, um, through every person in the through every person in the country, and is being dished out um, to the uh, to the masses at best, has to be adopted for you to make your point. So we have we can keep complaining about not getting enough notice, but you, if you're not using the jargon, if you're not saying I'm I'm oppressed, I'm a woman of color, I'm a person of color, if you're not saying that, it's not hitting home. So you have, we have to adapt and do some poor vipaksha as we say. So we have to understand that. Uh, I just wanted to quickly make another comment here. As a linguist, I could not uh, uh, take, uh, could not, uh, I can't just uh, uh, be quiet here. Um, one of the things that we don't use, like, you know, there are lots of words that we don't use in language. One of the words we, I don't use and a lot of people not, don't use is vernacular. Vernacular is a very colonial word uh, to demean Indian languages. So um, I know she didn't mean it, but since it came up, and my the linguist in me just came up and said, okay, so please do not use vernacular to talk about Bharatiya Bhasha. Please use Bharatiya Bhasha in the language. Thank you. We are finding that the media around the world, the media around the world, especially the United Kingdom where I can speak because I feel very um, anti India, anti Hindu, and everywhere we see. How can we, you, you guys, can help or any suggestions you can give us? How is the Shafa talking about it? This is not, thank you for asking this question, but this is not just a UK specific question, it's generally the situation all over the world. So I would urge all of us in this room it, to be more assertive, to speak up, to have a tool in social media and you can use it to maximum effect. We have to build institutions, we have to build platforms, but we can begin with starting to speak our voice. And yes, and let us not, I mean one of the major reasons why the other side gets popular is because we share it. I mean, we so indignant about what they write that we share the links and most of the people who are actually clicking on those links because they're really angry are our people. If you must share, and I agree that it's important to counter, share snapshots, but do not share links of revenue from what you say. You see it an anger. Share the link, they get the revenue and they don't care about what you say. So do not share the links, share screenshots. Do not share the liar, do not share the screen, do not share the quote. Do not share nepotism and dynasty TV. Do not share. Use snapshots if you must. And WhatsApp. Do not ignore WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a major, major opinion maker. So if somebody shares something that you have a problem against, voice your opinion. Because most of the times I have realized it, the silent majority as you know, is on your side. But they are waiting for the first person to say, hey, I disagree with this. If you say that, there will be five other people who say, who say that, yes, I disagree too, yes, I disagree too, yes, this is offensive to me. This happened in the, just uh, let me take one minute, this happened in the Katwa incident. After the Katwa incident, the kind of demonization that the entire Hindus faced was incredible. And nobody wanted to stick their neck out because the other side then would say, oh, you're defending rapists and that's a huge charge. Nobody wants to be faced with that. So I saw one WhatsApp uh, thing on my society WhatsApp group, which basically said about, you know, uh, the rape happened in the temple, Revistan, blah, 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 blah. And this happened at 10 o'clock. Nobody had reacted to it till 4 o'clock when I came back. And I said, you know what, this is wrong, this is factually wrong, and this is why it is wrong. And when I put the facts out there, suddenly, within 15 minutes, my WhatsApp was buzzing because there were at least 10 people who said that, yes, I agree, these are the facts. That narrative was false. But from 10 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the evening, nobody had said it. So you will need to stick your neck out and make that point. Maybe you'll be alone, but you need to do that. Wonderful. So thank you very much, everybody. So um, with this, we will conclude the session. And you know what? We live in social media world. Let the somewhat continue. We have everybody's, uh, uh, you know, the Twitter handle. Uh, we can talk over there since we're talking about social media or test them outside. 
And but officially, we have concluded this session. Thank you very much. Thank you for that.